Hello, and thank you for joining us for Public Health in Action, where we discuss various public health issues facing Stanley County. My name is Dennis Joyner, and I'm the director of the Stanley County Department of Public Health. Today we're going to be talking about one of the key foundations for uh, public health, uh, one of the things that uh, drives us in many, many ways uh, in the work that we do at the health department, and that is the uh, surveillance and the control and prevention of communicable diseases. Those things such as uh, rabies, uh, childhood uh, uh, diseases or illnesses that are maybe vaccine preventable, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and other communal diseases that uh, we can transmit from one to another in our community. It's a key uh, cornerstone of what we do in public health. And it actually is traced back many, many years, back to the 1850s in London, uh, when a physician named um, Dr. John Snow uh, was seeing a lot of cholera in his community. And there was a lot of deaths occurring and he felt somewhat helpless in trying to to uh, to tend to these illnesses and he actually started asking a lot of questions to the families of these patients as well as others in the community trying to find out perhaps where did they get their water where did they eat um, uh, where did they live uh, was it something in the environment because uh, he was seeing a lot of these deaths fortunately with all of this information that he was able to gather, he found out that um, he could trace w pretty much where he thought the illness was occurring, and it was at a communal well that was located on Broad Street in London. And he was able to convince the local officials that uh, I think if we take the well handle off and prevent people from using that particular well, we may see a decrease in the cholera cases. And lo and behold, uh, they did that and they saw the cholera cases go down because the well was contaminated. Uh, it's a little bit of a long story, but the interesting thing about it is we still use a lot of those same principles in public health in controlling communicable diseases. And so today I hope that uh, we'll be able to shed some new light about the importance of communicable disease control and I'm um, very pleased to have with me Cindy Russell, who is a, a lead communicable disease nurse with the Stanley County Health Department. And we're tickled to have you here today. Um, and sorry for that long lead in, but I felt it was, a, it kind of lays a little bit of a foundation for what communicable disease, the importance is, and um, the fact that it's such a uh, key foundation for us. I referred in that segue about an outbreak. Fortunately, we have uh, less outbreaks in some respects, massive outbreaks that we used to have in the 1850s that John Snow saw. But what is the, uh, uh, the definition of a, an outbreak or an epidemic? Well, the World Health Organization defines um, an outbreak as an occurrence of a number of cases of a disease that is unusually large or unexpected given a certain place or time. And outbreaks and epidemics are basically the same thing. And they usually come from a communicable disease, which is an illness that's due to an infected agent or its toxic products, which are transmitted directly or indirectly to a person from either another infected person um, an animal, an insect, or an inanimate environment like the air, soil, or water. So uh, people and the environment and things around us that are causing those influences are really the driving force behind those communicable diseases. What are some of the uh, recent kinds of outbreaks that health department here has had to deal with over the, the past years? Well, our most recent outbreak was the Shigella outbreak that originated in Cabarrus County and spread to Mecklenburg, Union, Rowan, and Stanley County. And that occurred over three months from October to December in um, 2013. And we actually um, tested 18 people and we only had two positive cases and two probable cases. But through all the counties, there were over 200 people tested and more than 60 that tested positive. 
and um, even more uh, probables as well. And um, at the very same time we had that going on, there was a Campylobacter outbreak that originated in Union County. And uh, we had um, people from Stanley County who actually work in Union County and attended a lunch at their workplace and um, they ended up with Campylobacter. So, you know, it can originate from lots of different sources, an outbreak can. And it can happen from a church barbecue. It could happen from eating at a restaurant that had some contaminated food or from an uh, employee who was sick. Um, it can even be just the flu that we're talking about, as well as sexually transmitted diseases or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Yeah, the list, is, mm -hmm. the list gets pretty, pretty broad when you really yes. start looking at it. And uh, I think that uh, one of the key aspects of it is surveillance and being able to sort of monitor the population's health of these types of illnesses. What, what are those warning uh, systems that kind of can help us increase our knowledge of the incidence of numbers of cases and how, does, um, how do we find out about these uh, kinds of illnesses? Well, we like to find out from the physicians first because physicians are actually mandated by general statutes of North Carolina to report communicable disease to the local health department. And it always helps if we get the information from them first because we have more time to do our investigation and the people can remember more of the things that they've eaten, where they've been, if they've been fishing, swimming, or whatever. Um, so it helps with memory if we get the information early. Last resort is that it actually feeds into our surveillance system from a lab report, a positive lab report. And if I get that lab report, then I contact the physician and talk with them, make sure the person is aware of their positive diagnosis. And then further investigation is done by um, talking with that person and getting all the information to put into the surveillance system. And that's how we connect the dots, so to speak. That's how, um, if they just see certain foods that are um, eaten and um, certain restaurants, then that way they know whether to further investigate, and it's actually called an outbreak when they can connect more of those dots. So it could actually, uh, uh, the, the quicker the better, I guess is the, the biggest indicator because some of these uh, tests actually take a little while for them to culture out or to develop enough that the lab would know that yes, this is a positive for uh, Shigella or Salmonella or some other particular type of illness. So there's lost time there sometimes in getting that report. Exactly, and that's why we go ahead and investigate each individual case. It may never turn out to be an outbreak and that would be great, but um, we want to investigate each case, even if it just happened from cross-contamination in your home of um, food products or something, but we want to make sure that we can keep um, some surveillance on it in order to prevent an outbreak. One of the things too that I think it's important for folks to, to be aware of is that oftentimes these illnesses mask similar illnesses and they have some of the same symptoms and so while we may think that uh, oh it's just a run-of-the-mill stomach bug that's going around and certainly we face that here in our community uh, we always have a little heightened alert because we're not always sure it could be something a little more serious that's right, because a lot of them start out with diarrheal illness, and that could come from anything. It can come from even medications, a side effect from some medications. So that's why the testing is very important. It's important to talk to your physician and let them know how long you've been sick and what um, you've been feeling like, what other signs and symptoms you may have too, so they know whether to actually do a culture and to find out if there is an organism that's causing the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. The health department has established uh, what's called an EPI team, uh, which helps address specific health concerns, specific, especially outbreaks. Um, 
What can you describe a little bit about what that epi team is and, and uh, what its function and purpose is? Sure, we have an epi team, and in general, we meet quarterly, but we can always call additional meetings should there be an outbreak or a concern in the community, and we do. Um, now, of course, you are our leader as our health department uh, director, and um, you actually have the ability to um, issue control measures and isolation orders, and um, you know you just guide and direct us with all of it. Then we have Patty Lewis, our family nurse practitioner um, at the health department who gives us medical guidance. Um, Patricia Hancock is our director of nursing and she's one of the EPI members. She assists with the meetings, um, helping make phone calls with the state epidemiologist, setting up our schedules, and making sure that all the departments are covered when we have an outbreak because we use more resources and more persons to take care of that. And then we have Becky McKee and she is our emergency preparedness coordinator. She sends out blast facts to the different physicians, hospitals, um, schools, the daycares, all kinds of information that we get together and feel is important to educate and to help with the prevention and to stop the outbreak. Um, Debbie Bennett and Jennifer Layton are also some of our uh, educators. They educate the public. They um, start with newspaper articles. They can be on the radio. Um, we have a television in our general clinic that's set up to have different things on it and they actually can put some information on there and there's a screen out in the commons and we have a marquee outside the health department in the parking lot that people can get information from too. Um, then uh, Dean Lambert with Animal Control actually is on the EPI team because there are some things that we have to look at with rabies and he makes sure the rabies clinics are set up in the springtime and um, he gives us guidance related to animal bites and reporting to the state, all those things. And we actually have to quarantine animals sometimes too. Um, and then Thomas Taylor is our IT person. He keeps us in touch with everybody in the state by the phone calls that we make and the internet access that we have and making sure our programs are all updated. And then of course, um, they're doing the grunt work. <laughs> Actually, I get to make all the phone calls and talk to people and ask them numerous questions. And um, then we pick up specimens sometimes and we make sure that they're sent to the lab. And we have environmental health. They're like our arms and legs in the community. They go out to make sure everybody is following guidelines, especially in restaurants and uh, daycares, nursing homes the schools, they help with sanitation, making sure they know when there is an outbreak, the correct things to clean with, um, and they just help with our control measures too. So it's a quite diverse and multifactorial group there that, that make up that, uh, yeah. uh, that operation. And once there is an outbreak or we have an indication of an outbreak, it gets quite active and uh, quite animated and in some ways uh, uh, it's sort of exciting from a public health standpoint because I think that's kind of where the rubber meets the road in some ways. Obviously it's not good for those who may be, may be sick out in the community, but uh, it's where I think we can um, bring some things to bear in helping address it that uh, really a physician's office or a hospital or others can't really uh, can't yeah. provide that kind of investigation. Generally speaking, uh, how do we respond when there is an outbreak in the community? Well, we first have to confirm it, and usually that comes from um, a positive lab resort result, sorry. <laughs> and um, then we have to investigate. We have to look further and see actually what caused that. Was it just an individual case, or is it because they ate at a restaurant? Is it because they ate a certain food that may have been recalled? And that's one way they even make recalls, because if they have a lot of people, they're eating the same products, they investigate it. And then we try to control the situation, and you do that by isolate, isolating people and by um, issuing guidelines to go by. And then there's the evaluation at the end. We always come together at the end, see 
what happened in our county, how many positive cases, did our control measures work, did the isolation orders work, and then we have to turn loose of those orders. We have to make sure we remind people that now they can lift those orders and go back to their normal livelihood. So it's quite an, quite an involved process with some very key uh, important steps. Uh, you mentioned the issue of confirmation. Um, what is the process for, for getting confirmation of these, of these cases? Well, we look for the positive lab result, but we all know that sometimes labs can make mistakes, so it's not only caused positive with a lab result. We also look at clinical signs and symptoms, and to be called a positive case, you have to have both signs and symptoms that match the disease process and the positive lab. A probable case can be somebody who is linked to um, a positive case and may not may not have been tested or their result may have been skewed by having some medication uh, that prevented you to be able to determine that positive lab result. So we really are dealing with uh, actual cases and then the probable cases are, okay. are the things we're actually uh, sort of looking at there. Uh, obviously uh, we want to try to reduce the threat and the spread of illness in the community, but what are the main reasons for investigating an outbreak um, other, than, other than that? I mean, I, there's a lot of different factors there, but uh, why is it so important? Well, it is important, and prevention is the key word, because we still have people who actually die from s some disease processes and from complications from some of these illnesses as well. Usually it's the elderly and the young that are more at risk, but they can um, get other complications that can cause their kidneys to quit functioning um, or respiratory systems, and so then they can actually lead to death, so that's why it's important. So in some cases it's not the actual communicable disease itself that actually causes the death or mortality. It's the contributing factor that takes someone over the edge somewhat. I mean, that's not always the case because obviously some communicable diseases can be fatal in and of themselves, but um, we're probably more concerned about those who are at greater risk of uh, being susceptible to complications. Exactly. Um, in terms of control measures that are put in place, what's the aim and purpose of uh, outbreak control measures? Well, control measures are recommendations and guidelines from the health department for prevention of transmission. Um, there are also guidelines for testing, diagnosing, and for treatment, and um, actual follow-up and returning to your previous, previous routine. Um, just like with the camp, uh, the Campylobacter case and with the Shigella case. The Campylobacter was a small contained outbreak, only a few in number, and so we did not actually have to issue any guidelines once the luncheon was over, the food was gone, the people had been sick, tested, so there was no further follow-up really, just getting the information and putting it into the surveillance system and to make sure that they um, returned to their healthy state of being. Uh, now with the Shigella outbreak, we actually issued control measures that um, informed the students that they could no longer use manipulatives, things like Play-Doh and sand in certain classes with the younger children and in daycares because of the contamination that could happen. Um, children were sent home. We worked with the school nurses. They were given guidelines to follow when to send a child home and um, all of these helped to prevent the spread of the disease. One of the things that I, th I think is important to point out too about control measures is that uh, in reality control measures are disruptive to people's lives and I know that that's one of the things we will often get phone calls uh, from folks who are like, well, what do you mean my child can't play with this? Or why are you discontinuing this? Or my child, what do you mean my child's gotta go home? Uh, before they had a little bug, no one was concerned about it. 
when there's an outbreak, it kind of ramps up the control measures and the importance. We can't be as, uh, I guess, as flexible in some ways in trying to, we live in this world where everybody loves their freedom, which is wonderful, but in a control outbreak situation, we often do have to limit people's um, freedom. And, and I know that's challenging for folks, but um, how, do we, how do you communicate that to folks who may be challenging those concerns sometimes? Well, most of that is done just through education. You know, a lot of people don't know how long someone can be sick with a certain type of disease process. And they also don't know the extent of the things they need to be cleaning in their home and how they can prevent the spread from one family member. Often, you know, a whole family will get sick, but if you can take that time to educate them, then hopefully nobody else has to get sick in the household. Um, and it, it's, it's mostly education, but also the fact that um, they need to know that their child doesn't need to get any sicker because you don't want any deaths occurring, especially with young, young children. And I think it uh, kind of gets back to the point that when they can stop long enough to see the big picture, how some of these efforts put in place right now is going to allow, uh, uh, hopefully, us to get through that outbreak much, much quicker in a controlled fashion. And uh, uh, fortunately, outbreaks typically don't go on forever, although sometimes we may think that they're going on forever when we're trying to deal with them. But getting folks to see the big picture and putting themselves in, uh, uh, looking at the more common good for the community, I guess, is the, the biggest issue uh, for why that personal disruption is, is important. You mentioned a little bit about the fact that, uh, that as the health director, I can issue quarantine. Uh, orders and isolation authority. Um, specifically, how does something like an isolation uh, order uh, impact control measures? Well, these are orders that actually tell the person they have to stay at home. That they can't be out in the public um, because of the risk of spreading the illness. And a lot of people do not like to be restricted and told what they can and can't do. But one example is just like with pertussis, when they are put on the medication to treat pertussis, then we don't want them out in the community during their period of communicability because they can spread that and then it can become an outbreak. So it's very important for them to stay home and to isolate until they finish that medication. And after the five days, they are finished with the medication, they're no longer communicable and they can go back to school, back to work and be out in the public even though they may still have a small cough. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So here again, that disruption uh, will pay off in the long run if they'll just abide by those. And that becomes uh, sometimes more challenging with isolation orders. We've talked about things that are more commonly communicable, but things such as uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Occasionally we run into those issues where um, we're having to intervene and those are sometimes a little more challenging uh, in some ways because we here again are uh, uh, discussing and, and requiring restrictions to certain types of behavior of a person. They can actually face penalties if they do not follow these guidelines either sometimes. Right. Uh -huh. Things particularly TB, TB for example, if the, uh, if the uh, guidance is not adhered to and we're not able to uh, get the proper treatment, unfortunately it can result in uh, uh, charges being brought and uh, folks being arrested for uh, violation of communicable disease control measures. So it is serious and we, we do take that seriously uh, in, in what we do. Um, other agents, obviously we can't do all of this ourselves. There's a lot of players that have come into play for communicable disease control. What are some of those agencies and, um, and how are they involved in some of these outbreak situations? Well, we work closely with the hospital. They have an infectious disease person and she usually reports the illnesses and wants to know exactly what to do with her staff that may have come in contact. And um, we work with them and she's like my right hand 
Her name is Deborah Norris at Stanley Regional. And then we also work with other hospitals very closely because, you know, most people do not just stay in Stanley County for all their care. Um, most people work out of the county, go out of the county to eat, and so, you know, we can't just be sticking to our borders. So we have to have a rapport with other counties, too. So we work with all the communicable disease nurses and the other health departments. Um, and even the hospitals in Charlotte, um, the hospitals at Concord, but we can call any hospital and talk to the infectious disease person. We also work with the state epidemiologist and the immunization branch because um, they help us with guidelines on what to do with certain cases. Um, they help give us guidance on how far to extend our um, population that we want to look at. Um, they help us with resources because sometimes we're taxed and if it's a big outbreak and if it's flu season two and we can't take everybody away from our general clinic, they send resources in to help us to gather the information and to make sure we're handling it appropriately and so that we can stay on task. Um, and it's very important to do those things because it can help contain the outbreak faster if we can act aggressively. I think one of the interesting things too is that we all want others to be successful in helping us control it because the sooner it can be controlled, the quicker we can get back to normal life and obviously uh, there's, uh, there's health implications for the people that we're trying to pre prevent from getting the illness, but uh, sometimes outbreaks can go on for an extended period of time and require a lot of resources and manpower to mm -hmm to try to address that. So we are very appreciative to other health departments who uh, are taking it seriously as well because if they can control things in Cabarrus County, it may mean that we're not going to get it over here in, uh, in Stanley County. So yeah. I think it's one of those things where uh, we certainly are all one big team in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about communicable disease and outbreaks, but what it, in situations where it may have happened from food sources, um, what are, um, what happens when it's a food source or a probable food source that causes the outbreak? What goes in the gear for those situations? Well, we usually start looking um, because somebody gives us a phone call most of the time or we get that positive lab result and we're calling the person and asking them, you know, what have you eaten for the last three days or 10 days, depending on which disease process we're looking at. And um, then they'll tell us if there's a restaurant that they ate at or something like that. And once we get more than one, if we have two or more cases, that say they've eaten the same food or at the same facility, then we start investigating a little further. Our environmental health department is great. They go out to the different restaurants and they can look, watch the uh, processes, how they're serving the food, um, the cleaning. They watch how dishes are um, cleaned, um, just the general cleaning of this facility and um, they have safe serve classes that they do for the restaurant employees so that they can hopefully maintain a good environment and we don't have to worry about that often. And um, they just work with us well. We have actually had to go as far as using the CDC before with some of our um, food outbreaks and sent specimens to the CDC because our state lab may not have been able to um, get the information that we needed or been able to do the tests that we needed. So we can go as far as the CDC for help too. Yeah, that's a good, just a very good point. Um, what are some of the control measures that are maybe a little bit different for uh, uh, when it's a food born outbreak uh, compared to other types of communicable disease? Well, if the, they suspect a certain food, then they remove it from the premises immediately and they can send it off for testing. Um, if it's an employee who has been sick, they can exclude that employee from work and actually request specimens to send to the lab. 
and then they uh, inform the public to avoid certain foods and that can happen through the local media and it can happen through food recalls and then they encourage everyone to seek medical treatment to make sure that they get better. One of the things I think is uh, that we're very sensitive of is that oftentimes when uh, there's a suspected foodborne outbreak, um, you know, we recognize that uh, this disruption also involves the economics sometimes of, of businesses or um, uh, for, of those establishments. And we want to work with them in coming to conclusions about how to address it. And so I think that uh, it's important that while we're looking at these control measures, you know, we, we do want to work with folks to actually allow them to recover and to be able to move forward because uh, quite honestly, many of us who get foodborne illnesses often do it to ourselves, oftentimes on our own, in our own kitchens um, and, and food counters. Uh, so it points out the fact that I guess prevention is always going to be the number one priority in trying to prevent these. Uh, could you speak a little bit about uh, those key aspects of, of prevention and the role in uh, preventing outbreaks? Well, um, we have different guidelines that are set aside by our state and by our federal government for foods in the way that they are grown, in the way they're processed, and chemicals that can and can't be used on them. And those are preventative measures so that we hope to never get to the point of having a disease. Um, we also have education um, for prevention to decrease the transmission and, and it's for the public as well as for professionals because you know uh, physicians and hospitals and schools you know we all need to work together because the more we can educate everybody then the less chance we have of spreading um, one disease and it becoming an outbreak. We also have increased access to information now, more available than we've ever had. I mean, this is a day that everybody can look up things on the internet and a lot of people have access to um, computers or tablets or their cell phones that they can actually get information right in front of them. And so that's a good thing. And so they can access the information to help um, know what's going on in the community too. And we use, um, funds that are allocated by the state to be able to provide things just like immunizations. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about immunizations, but that plays a big picture in prevention as well because there are a lot of diseases that if uh, the persons had been immunized, they may not have had it. Hepatitis A and B, um, the Tdap for pertussis, there's so many. And if we we'll just follow those guidelines and be informed about those, that helps. One of the things that you, as you mentioned vaccinations, it's important, I think, for everyone to be aware of that, you know, with all of the, the great medical technology that we have and the success that we've had over the years, particularly if you look at illnesses that, um, that affected my grandparents in the U.S. or in our community or even prior to that, I mean, polio, smallpox, I mean, you can go on down the list. A lot of those things which we don't see as much of as we did in those um, uh, different generations. However, they still are out there. And you mentioned pertussis and the fact that it does pop up from time to time. And there are states and communities that still do have measles outbreaks. Uh, with all of our great technology and medical uh, strength, so to speak, uh, there's still not 100% vaccinations out there. And so we need to keep in mind that, you know, many people, um, we, we vaccinate often because we're also protecting those who may not develop immunity from that vaccination. So the more that we're protected as a community, that in and of itself is a control measure in some respects for at least vaccine preventable diseases. So. Uh, I'm glad you, you did point that, that aspect out. Um, any other th thing you would like to add before we uh, close our segment today? 
Well, it's just important when we make phone calls to you and you get that phone call from the communicable disease nurse, not to be afraid, first of all. Um, we may be calling just to get some general information, but if you've been tested, your physician should let you know when they got back your positive test that we would be calling. Or if they're proactive, they can let us know that they tested before you actually get those results so that maybe you won't forget what you ate the past 10 days when we call you to ask that information. But just be willing to answer our questions. You know, we're not trying to point blame at any facility or any person or any food product, but it is very important that we try to keep your food clean so that that way you don't obtain diseases that might kill you or someone that you love. Um, it's very important to answer these questions. We get um, resources are allocated from the state according to the documentation that we provide, also according to the number of cases in certain areas. And um, they look when someone wants to write a grant to ask for additional resources. They look at how many cases you've had in your county, the resources that you've used, how you've used them. And so it's very important to support our county so that um, the resources are not discontinued and that we can continue to be able to provide services that promote a healthy environment for your children and grandchildren to grow up in. Well, I think that's well said and I think it's uh, fitting too as we look at uh, the way I started it off, the fact that uh, outbreak control and epidemiology uh, play such an important part in what we do and uh, keeping the community healthy and um, it takes a lot of work to, to make that happen when outbreaks do occur and uh, that's sometimes overlooked I think in the general public the amount of energy that goes into that. So I want to thank you for the work that you do and uh, control helping control this with the health department and so I will uh, close with that and I want to thank the uh, Stanley Community College for uh, taping this episode and until we meet again I wish you a very healthy day thank you